before recommending that he be sentenced to death for the killing of five-year-old Shania Davis. Sometimes we make mistakes and sometimes we act stupid. In today's true crime story, I'm going to look at the tragic tale of Shania Davis who was 5 years old. But a quick note, her brother is mentioned quite a lot in this story. Her brother at the time was 7 years old. His name was never revealed. So in the story, I will refer to him as just the brother. Also, stay till the end where a sickening twist takes place in this story. I was pissed, trust me. In September 2009, Shania Davis was 5 years old and along with her mother Antoinette Davis and her 7 year old brother lived in the trailer of Antoinette's sister Brenda Davis located in Sleepy Hollow Trailer Park in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Brenda had previously been seeing Mario McNeil, who is the main suspect of this story. Mario had given Brenda the deposit to move into the Sleepy Hollow trailer. Because Mario spent time at the trailer, he knew Antoinette had been in the presence of Shania and her brother before, and he also knew how to get into the trailer even when the door was locked. At the time of the events, Brenda was seeing G. Roy Smith, who was the father of her children. Brenda, G. Roy and their children stayed in the back bedroom, while Antoinette and her children stayed in the front room of the trailer. Mario lived with April Autry, the mother of his 18-month-old daughter on Washington Drive in Fayetteville. Now, on the evening on November the 9th, 2009, and continuing into the early morning hours of 10th of November 2009, after ingesting cocaine, and a couple shots of liquor, Mario began texting all the females in his phone. He tried to text Brenda but her phone was turned off. Another woman, Taser McLean, who also lived in Sleepy Hollow, began exchanging text messages with Mario and agreed to invite him over. However, by the time Mario arrived at Sleepy Hollow at 2.52am on the 10th of November, Taser had fallen asleep and did not answer Mario's text. At 3.06 a.m., Mario texted goodnight to Taser and then again at 3.07 a.m. Now at 5.30 a.m., Brenda woke up as she thought she heard a door open. She woke up Giroy asking, is somebody here? Brenda and Giroy went back to sleep but were reawakened at around 6 a.m. by Antoinette who came into the room and asked if they had seen Shania. When they responded in the negative, Antoinette told them she was going outside to search for Shania. While Antoinette was outside, the younger brother told Brenda and Giroy that Mario had been there the previous night. Giroy asked the brother, are you sure Mario was here? And he said yes. Brenda text and call Mario but he did not answer his phone. Giroy then called April Autry who told him that Mario was not with her. Antoinette returned to the trailer and reported that she had knocked on doors in Sleepy Hollow but that no one had seen Shania. Brenda told Antoinette to call the police but Antoinette was hesitant to do so. Keep that in mind. Brenda and G. Roy went outside and noticed that the stairs and railings of the trailer contained feces that had not been there the night before. Shortly after 6am the same morning, Mario arrived at the Comfort Inn and Suites in Sanford where he entered the hotel alone, provided identification and checked into room 201 under his own name. There was video footage of this transaction throughout the hotel. Mario told the front desk clerk Jacqueline Lee that he was traveling with his daughter to take her to her mother in Virginia. Video footage from hotel security cameras showed that after checking in, Mario returned to his vehicle in the back of the parking lot at approximately 6.17 a.m where he remained for several minutes before he came back into the hotel carrying a child covered in a blanket. Lee observed Mario carrying the child on the video feed and noticed the texture of her hair, which Lee recalled when she saw an amber alert that was issued for Shania. At the hotel's morning shift, Regina Bakari replaced Lee at the front desk. During the shift change, 
Mario came to the breakfast area alone, got a banana, some juice and a muffin and took them back to his room. Lee pointed Mario out to Bacani and told her about the recent check-in. Hotel cameras showed Mario walking toward the breakfast area at 6.36am and returning down the hall and into his room with food and drink in his hands. Back at Sleepy Hollow, Antoinette called the police after being forced to by Brenda. Again, keep that in mind. About 10 minutes after Antoinette's telephone call, the police arrived, began searching for Shania with canines and started interviewing people. Fayetteville Police Officer Elizabeth Culver observed a substance that was later determined to be feces on both railings of the front porch. Antoinette Davis had a cooking pot in her hand when Officer Culver arrived and someone said Antoinette had poured hot water on the railings so Officer Culver asked her to not do that. In the trash can of Unit 1119, police found a blanket that Antoinette Davis identified as hers and which Jiro Smith recognized as having been in the living room of the trailer recently. The blanket was a thick child's blanket and it had feces on it. Jennifer Slish, a forensic technician for the Fayetteville Police Department at that time, took the blanket into evidence to be processed for fluids, fibers and hairs. Officer Culver spoke with Antoinette, Brenda Giroy and their brother at the scene. The brother seemed very distracted and would look at his aunt before responding. He said he remembered Shania going to bed but doesn't remember if he saw her going out. And in the trial, the brother ultimately testified that he saw Mario in the trailer. Because Antoinette and Brenda were consistently looking at their phones and texting, Officer Culver had difficulty getting them to focus on the questions being asked. So her lieutenant agreed to take them downtown to be interviewed. Officer Culver and her partner, Daniel Suggs, went to the main office of the trailer park to view the security video so as to look for a child roaming around the trailer park or for vehicles coming into the area. At 7.35am, this video showing Mario exiting the doors from the hotel with Shania in his hands. Matthew Argyle, the hotel's maintenance worker at the time, appeared on the video one minute later. Argyle later testified that he was outside the side door picking up cigarette butts and trash when he saw Mario come out with a five or six year old female on his shoulder. Mario had her covered and Argyle thought, well, she's probably asleep. When Argyle said hello, Mario made eye contact with him before looking away without saying anything in response and continuing walking toward the parking lot. Argyle noticed something was amiss and he thus tried to observe Mario without making it obvious that he was doing so. Mario put the child in the right rear passenger side of his car, got into the driver's seat and began smoking a cigarette or cigar. Mario eventually approached the front desk and asked Bacani for his security deposit stating that he had to get back on the road to drive his daughter to Virginia to meet her mother. The housekeeper, who later cleaned room 201, brought Bacani one or two small clear open plastic packets with a white residue that she had found in the room which Bacani believed to be cocaine. Meanwhile, Argyle watched Mario leave the hotel entrance, get back in his car, drive away and turn left onto the main road. Argyle did not act on his feeling that something was wrong until the following day when hotel staff saw an amber alert and called law enforcement. The hotel security cameras show Mario leaving the hotel's front entrance and getting into his car at 7.40am after which the car turned towards Highway 87. Now telephone records show that around 7.45am Mario texted Brenda and he said hey. Brenda, who was at the police station at this time, had texted Hay back to Mario after learning from the brother that Mario had been in the trailer the previous night. At approximately 8.22am, cell phone tower pings showed Mario's phone to be near the intersection of Highway 87, Highway 24 and Highway 27. Brenda sent a text message to Mario after saying, you've been to my house. To which Mario said, no, why? To which Brenda said, you're lying. To which Mario responded, can I come over? To which Brenda said, hell no. They then went back and forth where Mario said, damn, it's like that. Brenda then said, don't ever text me back. Then Mario asked her, why is her man calling his girl? Mario's final text message to Brenda was, what the hell is going on? Brenda testified that she did not tell law enforcement she was text messaging 
Mario during the same time she was at the station because she didn't want to assume anything at that point. For the same reason, she did not immediately tell police what the brother had said about seeing Mario in the trailer. Now, Bacani finished working at the Comfort Suites at 3pm and reported back for the 7am shift the next day on the 11th of November 2009. Bacani and Lee then noticed the Amber Alerts were on the hotel computer screen. Lee thought the picture shown on the screen was that of the same child she had observed with Mario the previous morning and accordingly she called the Amber Alert hotline. When the forensic technicians arrived, having responded to the call, they processed room 201 for evidence. The hotel manager advised the technicians that the bedding had not been changed but that the trash had been taken out and a towel had been removed before staff became aware of the situation. Two comforters from the bed were taken and processed for evidence. Charles Kimball, who was at the time a captain in the Fayetteville Police Department and in charge of its investigation bureau, was responsible for the logistics of trying to find Shania. Based on the video at the hotel, police believed Mario is the one with Shania. After obtaining Mario's cell phone number from his mother, police gave the number to FBI Special Agent Frank Brostrom who began an analysis of Mario's phone. Brostrom testified that the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children had already notified the FBI about the case. According to Brostrom, when the FBI receives a notification of a missing child, agents immediately contact local law enforcement to offer assistance. Brostrom contacted Sergeant Chris Corsian of the Fayetteville Police Department who quickly invited Brostrom to come and help with the search for Shania. Brostrom arrived at Sleepy Hollow on the 10th of November. Now in these kind of circumstances, including situations when young children are missing, the FBI can make a showing of imminent danger of serious bodily injury or death and thereby obtain communication carriers information such as telephone data, GPS, toll records and cell tower records. Brostrom had already telefaxed these circumstances requests to telephone companies to obtain information on phone numbers belonging to Brenda Davis, Antoinette Davis and an associate of theirs. And on November the 12th, Bostrom made a request for information regarding Mario's phone number. Essentially, he had to justify why he needed these records. He got the justification. So now he was able to go through the phone records and see, okay, what's going on? Bostrom quickly obtained information associated with Mario's cell phone, including call details, cell phone tower locations and text messaging with longitudes and latitudes for the cell towers for which the phone number would have pinged. Mario's cell phone data was analyzed by Special Agent Michael Sutton of the FBI's Cellular Analysis Survey Team, otherwise known as CAST. CAST assesses cellular telephone records and applies the cell tower and sectors utilized by a particular phone to map its location. When Sutton received the electronic information from Mario's cell phone, he performed an initial analysis, created some rough draft maps and provided Bostrom an initial search area in the Highway 87 area along Highway 27. Following the FBI's recommendation, police began searching for Shania in the area around Highway 87 from Spring Lake towards Sanford. Having received offers of assistance from volunteers and different law enforcement agencies, investigators mobilized a huge search and rescue effort. After the hotel video showing Mario, where the child believed to be Shania came to light, Brenda Davis and Giroy Smith told police that the brother had seen Mario at the trailer the night Shania disappeared. Now Brenda said that she also saw Mario talk to Antoinette at Antoinette's aunt's house, to which Antoinette said to Mario, stay the fuck away from me, I just want to know where the fuck my baby is at. That's a direct quote. To which Mario said, alright, then he jumped in his car and sped away. Brenda began to think Antoinette was lying about what she knew and Brenda and Antoinette argued and did not speak after this. Remember when I told you pay attention to the lack of police calling? Ah, I'm coming on to that. In the evening hours of 12th of November, Brenda talked to detectives again told them about the text messages with Mario and ultimately gave them her phone to take photos of these texts. The same day, police found Mario and he agreed to come to the station to speak with them. Police also located Mario's Mitsubishi Galant, 
which was backed into a space at the Mount Sinai Apartments away from his residence on Washington Drive. Police did a search of the vehicle's trunk and then had the car towed to the police department. The car was processed for forensic evidence, which included taking soil samples from the wheel wells and taking the brake and gas pedal covers for substance analysis. So, on November the 12th at 9pm, police interview Mario to find out where Shania is. Although Shania had now been missing for two days, officers were still hopeful of finding her alive. The officers did not handcuff Mario or place him under arrest and they specifically informed him that the door to the interview room was unlocked and he was free to leave the room. Mario also had his cell phone on him which he continued to receive messages and which he used during breaks in the interview. Mario admitted he was at Sleepy Hollow just after midnight on the 10th of November driving around in the black Mitsubishi. But at first he denied going into the trailer, taking Shania and then he also denied being at the hotel. When police showed Mario a photograph of himself at the hotel, Mario initially denied it. They told him, hold on a minute, someone checked into a room with your identification. Here's the video evidence. Mario claimed, well, maybe my identity was stolen. That's not me. But then eventually he admitted he was in the hotel with Shania. About 50 minutes into the interview, Mario began telling a story about receiving a text message which he said he thought came from Brenda Davis's phone, telling him to come to Sleepy Hollow and pick Shania up on the porch. Mario said he got Shania, took her to the hotel room where he ingested cocaine. According to Mario, while he was at the hotel, he got a call or text message from some unknown people to bring Shania to a dry cleaning establishment at the corner of Country Club Drive and Ramsey Street. Mario stated, that he delivered Shania to these unnamed people and that they were going to drive a grey Nissan Maxima. But then Mario told police he was actually waiting for a call as people were going to ask him to come and kill Shania. The police then asked him to expand on this statement but Mario refused. He did not continue talking about it. The messages on Mario's phone exchanges with Brenda did not pertain to picking up someone waiting on the porch as Mario claimed during the interview. There were no calls or text messages to Mario phone from unknown persons. The only messages during this time period were between Mario and Brenda's phones. At the end of the interview, Mario was arrested for kidnapping Shania. Now, later the police looked at the interview video and they noticed something peculiar. During the breaks of the interview, Mario made the sign of the cross, took out a key, got down on the floor, put the key in a wall electrical socket and appeared to receive a jolt. Mario then took off his shoes and put the key in the electrical socket again. Now Shania had been reported missing on the 10th of November and a massive search was continuing along Highway 87 but had not yet located Shania. Kimball, the head investigator for the Fayetteville Police Department, later testified in a pre-trial hearing that on the morning on the 13th of November, he met with then District Attorney Ed Granis about several cases including this one. The District Attorney pulled Kimball aside and told Kimball that Alan Rogers, a Fayetteville defense attorney, might have some information that could help him in the case and that Rogers would be calling him. Kimball did not know how Granis knew Rogers might be able to assist. Rogers had accompanied Mario in his first appearance on Friday morning following his arrest on kidnapping charges and it was Kimball's understanding that Rogers was Mario's attorney in this matter. The following day, Kimball received a call from attorney Coy Brewer. Brewer said the information Kimball needed was to look for green porta potties on Highway 87 to try and find Shania. Based on the information he received earlier that Alan Rogers would be calling, Kimball assumed after receiving the call from Coy Brewer that Brewer and Rogers were working together on the case. Police did look for these green porta potties on Highway 87 and they saw numerous on the road. Rogers later followed up with Kimball and said police needed to look for green porta potties in an area where they killed deer on Highway 87 between Spring Lake and Sanford. According to Kimball, Rogers stated in a subsequent phone call, let me talk to my guy and later called back to say they need to look in an area where hunters field dress deer after they kill them. Kimball called Rogers to see if there were any additional details and he said, well, that's all my guy knows. My guy being Mario. Searchers did not locate Shania that day and search resumed the following morning, 16th of November 2009. 
a Sanford company training canine officers from the Virgin Islands volunteered to assist in the search. But then, on 1 p.m. that day, this new volunteers from the Virgin Islands, they used one of their dogs, and the dog was able to locate the body of Shania. It was lying partially under a log in an area with deer carcasses near the intersection of Highway 87 and Walker Road. Police collected forensic evidence at the scene. On the 19th of November 2009, Mario was charged with first-degree murder and first-degree sexual assault of the victim. On the 5th of July 2012, a Cumberland County Grand Jury indicted Mario for first-degree murder, sexual assault of a child by an adult offender, sexual offence of a child by an adult offender, felony child abuse inflicting serious bodily injury, felony child abuse by prostitution, first-degree kidnapping, human trafficking, sexual servitude, and taking indecent liberties with a child. And on May the 29th, 2013, Mario McNeil was sentenced to death. Now you may ask, hold on a minute, where does the trafficking, the prostitution, and all those other charges come from? Well, here's the twist. It was revealed during the trial that the mother, Antoinette Davis, was involved. She owed a drug debt. From what I researched, it was around 200 bucks. She told Mario, come to my trailer, take my daughter, give my daughter to these people, whoever they are, the I owe money, and they will sexually assault her. Like, what the fuck is this? Antoinette Davis herself was sentenced to 17 and a half years in prison. So here's my question to you to conclude on this story. Was Antoinette's sentence long enough? See, I've spoken about the death penalty before. I still don't know how I feel about it. But for some reason, in this case, for Mario, it seems right. Him getting the death penalty, it makes sense. But what about Antoinette? She's the one that would have told Mario, like Mario would have woken up one day, carried on with his life, and then all of a sudden, he must have got a call from Antoinette saying, yo, this is about to go down. I owe this much money. Why don't you take my daughter, let them do what they want with her, and then bring her back or whatever. To me, she's just as culpable as Mario. What a truly tragic, disgusting story. Comment, tell me what you think.